here. But today we're going to continue with the series Selfless, and we're going to talk about being faithful in service to others. Now, if someone came to you and asked you a very simple question, the question might be, uh, is there one word, or if someone said, you always something, what would that always be? You know, he or she always does this. They always do that. In your life, what would that be? What is it that you are known for always doing? Okay, what would others say that you are always doing? Just think about it for a moment. What am I always doing? For some people, they may say, well, they're always encouraging. Or they might say, they're always griping. Or they might say, well, they're always finding fault. Oh, no, they're always finding good in someone. Or it might be, they're always working, or they're always working out. Uh, they might have some kind of way of describing you about what you're always doing, you know. I, they're always sharing their faith, or they're always sharing a selfie on Facebook. Okay, what is it that you're always doing? I want you to get that in your mind for a moment. What is it that you are always doing? Because if we, we're honest with where we are in society today, we are a very, I hate to say it, self-serving, self-gratifying self-promoting society. We have made so much about self, and that has invaded a lot of people's lives. In fact, it was kind of funny. Uh, I looked online. If you just put self-promotion in, your, in uh, a search engine, take Google and put self-promotion, it'll pop up all kinds of articles and all kinds of books about how to promote yourself, how to show yourself off. And some of them I thought were pretty funny. There was an article that said, 10 powerful examples of self-promotion done right. And it starts out with a line that self-promotion is an art, okay? Learning how to make yourself look good is an art. Another one was, and I, I had to laugh at this one, 40 ways to self-promote without being a jerk. <laughs> so that's a great article. So if you want to look that one up, it's honestly pretty interesting. And there's some books. There's The Art of Self-Promotion, Six Ways to Get Your Work Discovered, okay? And the one that really caught my attention is a book that simply was titled Brag Better, just brag better about yourself, promoting yourself. And here's an interesting thing that you may not know. Do you, do you know what more than half the teenagers in our country right now want to do for a career? 54% of teenagers, when, have, when they were asked that question, say they want to be an online celebrity. They want to be an influencer. They want to be a YouTube sensation. They want to be noticed by the world through the internet. Uh, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? 54% of teenagers answered it that way. But that doesn't surprise me. Many of us want to be what people now, you hear the term all the time, they want to be the goat. Okay, you know what a goat is, right? How many of you know what goat is? Okay, greatest of all time. The people want to be the greatest of all time. They want to be recognized as being the greatest. They want people to see them as better than others. They want to be recognized for their talents. They want the focus on themselves. And so much of life is built around that. But then I look at what Jesus taught. And that doesn't sound like Jesus at all. Jesus, as we've been learning, has taught us to be selfless. To not make it about me but making it about others. Jesus is the one who told us to deny ourselves and pick up a cross, which is literally stop self-promoting and do what I want done and do it every day. That's what he taught. It's so antithetical to who Jesus is to say, I want to worry about being the greatest of all time. I want to be noticed. I want to be an influencer. I want fame. I want some kind of recognition in life. And In fact, Jesus said it this way. Matthew 23, the greatest among you will what? The greatest among you will be your servant. Your servant. It's not about people looking at you. It's not about people patting you on the back for what you've done. It's not about making all about the attention that you receive. It's about denying yourself and making, about, making it about other people. It's about being a servant. It's about getting outside of yourself. See, here's what you need to understand, and we're going to hang on this a lot today. Serving is not an action that we do. A lot of people serve. But what Jesus is talking about is an, ex an expression of who we are. Serving is an expression of who we are. 
We don't serve because serving is a good thing to do. We serve because of who we are, who God is in us. It's an expression of Jesus Christ in our lives. It is us, not what we do, but who we are because we are Christ's servant and Christ lives within us. And so maybe it's really important for us to ask ourselves the question, what are you always doing? What is it that you are always doing? What is it in your life that you can say, I'm always doing? And I love, there's a great example in Scripture of a person who was always doing something and was recognized for it. It's found in Acts chapter 9, in verse 36 in particular. It says, in Joppa, there was a disciple. The disciple's name was Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. Probably shoot her parents for that name. Uh, but anyway, Dorcas... <laughs> And my wife was called that a lot when she was growing up because her name is Dora, and she was, yeah, it was not a pleasant name for my wife growing up. Uh, but despite, well, you know, th what's interesting, the name Dorcas, the name Tabitha, is uh, translated gazelle, which denotes beauty. She was probably known for her beauty in some way. But she's called out here, why? She was always doing good and helping the poor. She is, she is the first Greek female mentioned in the New Testament, and she's called out as a believer for doing good, for always helping others. We learn when you read her story as part of chapter 9 that, that she would sew clothes for the poor and make sure the poor had clothing. She cared for widows. She was so recognized by the people in her community that she, when she died, the whole community was upset, and they wanted they wanted Peter to do something about it and Peter literally goes up to the room where she's lying in state tells everybody to leave and God through Peter resurrects her from the dead why because she was a servant because she had done good, because people would miss this person who was in their life she was an example and so God used her because of her life to reach I don't know how many. It just says many came to, to know the Lord because of this event. Because a woman recognized for her service and for her love of helping others was risen from the dead, people took notice. Because instead of serving self, she was always serving others. She was always serving others. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Pretty amazing. What is it like to be that kind of faithful servant? What does it take to be a faithful servant? How do you and I become a faithful servant? How do we do that? That when someone says they always do this, it would end up like Tabitha. She always did good. She always helped others. Well, I think there's three things from three different stories that we can learn from today that teach us how to be faithful in service. The first is simply bring a lunch. Okay. I'll explain that in a minute. So you can bring a lunch. The second thing we're going to talk about is offer a ride. And the third one we're going to talk about is simply carry a towel. Carry a towel. So let's look at really what that means and what those things are talking about. What does it mean to bring a lunch? I want you to go back to the Old Testament for a moment. Remember the story of David when he was a young boy. Uh, his brothers were off fighting against the Philistines. And if you remember the story of David and Goliath, that's the one we all focus on is about David defeating Goliath. His brothers are all out you know, serving the army, fighting the Philistines, and he is home tending sheep. He wants to help. He wants to do something. He wants to, to be productive. He wants to be a part of the solution. And this is the guy who we know as King David. He was a war hero as an adult. He was an extremely brave king. He was called a man after God's own heart. He rose to notoriety because of Goliath. He was loved. He was honored. When he came into town, women would sing songs about him, you know, I'm waiting for the day when I come home and my wife starts singing songs about me. That will be a great day. But women would come to, when David came into town and they would sing songs about him. This is the man we're talking about. But why was David great? It wasn't because 
of killing Goliath. It's because he was a young shepherd boy. Okay? It's because he learned to carry a basket. He wanted to do something. One of eight sons. And here's his story in 1 Samuel 17. One day Jesse, his father, said to David, Take this basket of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. You may think that's just kind of a simple request, but I want you to think through what this really means. David wanted to make a difference. David wanted to do something. David wanted to join his brothers in battle, and his father says, I want you to carry a basket to them. I want you to bring them nourishment. David, don't seek doing the great things. I need you to serve your brothers. You don't have to be in the spotlight. It's not insignificant what I'm asking you to do. To serve is more important. And that was a test, I think, for David. Would he do the service that was required? You want to win the battle, David? Carry the basket first. You want to be important? Then serve others first. That's the lesson he's teaching his son here. And this is a lesson for David. And this is actually kind of what Mark David, who brings the lunch. That's what he's saying. That act of service is great. Bring a lunch. When you have the opportunity to do good, do good. Doesn't matter how insignificant you think it is, it's what needs to be done. So simply be willing to carry a basket, to bring food, to be a help to someone. That's what he's saying here. And David's example is great because he does that. And how does the story end? When he proves himself in simple acts of service, God uses him to defeat Goliath. He became great by serving, not by defeating. That's how he became great. Also, you can offer a ride. First you can bring a lunch, but then you can also offer a ride. About, 400, or about 553 years before uh, the events occurred with uh, Jesus entering Jerusalem, the prophet Zechariah prophesied about it. And basically, he said, a king would ride into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Now, if you read that prophecy, that is a shocking statement because kings don't ride on the back of donkeys. Okay, that's not how a king would enter the country. A king would enter the country on a white horse or being drawn or with servants all around him, having a great big flashy robe and a crown on his head. I mean, if it was like, if we put it in today's kind of setting, he would come in a great big stretch limousine with police cars in front and police cars in back and everybody attending to him. And how does Jesus choose to come into Jerusalem? Riding a scooter. Okay, that would be the analogy today. He comes on the back of a donkey. You know, there's no paparazzi. All those things you would expect. How did he get that donkey? Where did it come from? He instructed his folks to go talk to a gentleman and ask for that donkey. It's found in Luke 19.31. He says, as they talked to this owner of this animal, they said, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it, this donkey, simply say this. The Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. He needs a ride. This is the ride he's chosen. He needs a ride. And here's what we, we don't know this guy. We don't know his name. I'm assuming he's a businessman or at least someone with some degree of wealth because only wealthy people or business people own donkeys. Okay? Maybe he had a donkey rental agency, <laughs> I don't know, where he had lots of different donkeys that he would lend out to people and they could pay to use them. Uh, but what we know about this particular donkey is that it had never been ridden before. It was probably very valuable. And he's asked to let the Savior ride on it. Here's what he doesn't do. He doesn't look at it and say, I don't want to give you the best one. How about the one that's worn out? If I give you the best one, I'm going to have to charge you more because it's really a special donkey. 
It's an unridden donkey. So I don't know, you know, this is, this is important to me. Maybe I shouldn't give it to you. Maybe I should save it for someone else. You say, guys, get this. This is an Eeyore. This is the best I've got. Okay. No miles. Okay. Hooves don't need to be changed yet. What does he do? He gave a gift to Jesus to make a way for Jesus to enter town. He gave him the ride that he needed. No questions asked. He did what needed to be done. He gave the ride that was needed. He was the one that stepped up. He's the one that didn't look for personal gain. He's not the one who cared what he got in return. Jesus needed something, and he wanted to provide it. How do you become a servant? You don't look for what you get in return. You give because the Lord has need of it. If God has need of anything that you have, you give because the Lord has need of it. How do you become great as a servant? It's not about you. This stuff isn't your own anyway. Who created that that animal? Was it that person? Or was it the creator of the universe? It was his already. So you offer a ride. That could be really translated into what we do with our own lives. We offer rides sometimes, don't we? No matter how inconvenient it might be, or we think so. In fact, I just want to share, this just happened to me last night. I, I know I share personal stories, but God always has a way of driving home a point with you. Uh, not only did I go to that movie I told you guys about with my my uh, granddaughters, but during the middle of a movie, I got a text message from one of the football players on the ISU team, and he said, Pastor John, I have a favor to ask of you, and I said, go ahead and ask. I'm texting him while I'm watching the movie, right? I'm not supposed to do that, but I did it anyway. Turned my screen down so it wasn't so bright, uh, and he said, uh, my car isn't working, and I need to go get groceries. Would you be willing to take me to get groceries? And so I simply texted back and said, if 7.30 p.m. works great for you, I'll be there. And he said, that would be perfect. And so last night, after I took my wife home and dropped my grandkids off at their house after the movie, I drove to his house and took him to Winco shopping for an hour and a half so he could get the the food that he needed to put in his house so that he could eat. You offer a ride. Someone has need of it. God calls you to help others. You offer a ride. You're a servant because God We're called to be servants. It's what God asks us to do. I didn't ask for anything in return. He kept apologizing, saying, well, I'm keeping you from your wife. And I said, oh, she doesn't care, right? It's okay. It's no big deal. She just spent four hours sitting next to me in a movie theater. She's just fine, and she's had enough of me for the day, okay? Oh, I'm keeping you from other stuff. I said, there's nothing more important than meeting your need right now. If that's what God's called me to do, that's what I do. If you have need of a ride, here it is. Anytime, anywhere. That's what servants do. How do you become a servant? Bring a lunch. Offer a ride. But thirdly, you carry a towel. Just before the Passover, Thursday evening, Jesus is gathered in an upper room with some of his friends, kind of a secret meeting that's going on. Jesus knew full well what was going to transpire. He knew he was going to be giving his life shortly for those that he loved. And in the midst of this meal that they're supposed to have together, an argument springs up. And the disciples start arguing about who is the goat. That's literally what they were arguing. Who is the greatest of all time, Jesus? Which person is the greatest among us? And so they began to debate that between each other. And I can just imagine what's going on here. I can see John speak up and say, well, you know, I obviously am the greatest because I'm the beloved one of God. He loves me. Jesus loves me more than others. In fact, John was the kind of person who was arrogant enough to, when he wrote, he wrote in second person about himself and, and kind of, oh, see, I'm really important to Jesus. I'm the one that Jesus truly loves. And Peter would say, oh, no, 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 God, you can't go there. I'm the one, remember, that came walking out on water. And John had looked and said, yeah, but after three feet, you sunk, buddy. Uh, that, no, but he was the one that lifted me up out of the water. I'm the one that's always jumping to his defense. I'm the one who, who's really bold and willing to do whatever it takes, no matter what. And Bartholomew probably looks in and says, well, what about me? And 
They all, all look at him and say, nobody knows, Bartholomew, that you're even a disciple, so it doesn't really matter about you, okay? Could you imagine what was going on? And Jesus is hearing this kind of argument about who's the greatest right in front of him. So Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. In the midst of debating who's the greatest, what does Jesus do? He picks up a towel. The custom is, you know, or maybe you don't know, when someone comes to a home at that time, because most people wore sandals, their feet was dirty, usually a servant or someone that was uh, in the household that was lower would come and literally wash your feet as you walked into the home so that you could sit down and eat. Uh, people say, well, why is that important? I mean, you got your feet under the table. Realize most of the time they reclined for dinner. The table was almost at ground level, and your feet was in somebody else's face. You just need to kind of understand how that worked. And so it was common courtesy to do that, to make sure feet were clean. It was a way of showing sign and respect for those who came into the home. It's kind of like us saying, can I take your coat, right? Can I offer you something to drink? That's kind of our common courtesies. Their common courtesy was to wash the feet, and no one had done it. Yet they're all arguing about who's the greatest. Instead of challenging them with their words and their argument, Jesus gets up and serves. He takes that towel, wraps it around his waist, gets the water, and begins to wash each of their feet. I don't know about you, but washing feet is kind of ucky. I mean, do you really want to touch other people's feet? How many in here want to do that? I mean, sometimes I can barely touch my own feet sometimes. <laughs> okay? But here he is going from disciple to disciple, washing each of their feet. Why? Because they were dirty and they needed washing. And Jesus, get this, who is Jesus? Who is this guy that's doing this? King of King, Lord of Lords, Jesus, the Son of God, the living water, the Lamb of God, the true vine, the bread of life, the light of the world. That's the guy who's picked up the towel. He's the King of glory. He's the Prince of peace. He's the great high priest, Scripture says. He's the righteous judge. He is the chosen one of God. He is our Redeemer, our rock, our salvation, our righteousness, and he is kneeling down, washing feet. Why? Why? Because that's what a servant does. That's being a servant. He didn't come to be served. He said he came to serve. Not for someone else to do for him, but what he can do for someone else. And he calls us to be a servant. He calls us to do that, to be a servant. And that's a challenge, I think, for each and every one of us. Are we a servant? We should be. I want you to say this with me. I am a servant of the Most High God. Let's say that together. I am a servant of the Most High God. I want you to say that loud again. I am a servant of the Most High God. When I serve others, I am serving Christ. When I serve others, I am serving Christ. Uh, now, let's say this together. I am a servant of the Most High God. Go ahead. When I serve others, I am serving Christ. That's who we are. It's not what we do. Because I am a servant of the Most High God, I do what God does. I do what his son does. It's because he lives in me. I am a transformed person. I serve others because that's who I am. It's not just a privilege. It's an expression of my very being. And I don't think about what I get in return. If my Savior can kneel and wash feet, there's nothing he shouldn't be able to ask of me. And I should be willing to do it. Remember last week we shared the story about Jesus separating the sheep and the goats? I, I love that. Think about that in today's context. He takes his sheep that are faithful followers, servants, and he takes the goats 
the people who want to be the greatest of all time, and he separates them away. And he honors the sheep, and he tells goats, you're in big trouble. You've made it all about yourself, about serving yourself. You've made it all about you, and you don't care about others. And guess what? I'm separating you. You're not selfless. You're selfish. So you're over here, and the selfless servants are over here. You want to be the greatest of all time? Then you get the reward that the greatest of all time get, a separation between sheep and goats. That's what goes on. And remember he talked about, remember when you clothed me, remember when you fed me, remember when you visited me in prison, okay? Remember those things. Remember when you invited me in and gave me food to drink in a place. Remember those things. And remember what the faithful servant said? We don't have any idea what you're talking about, Jesus. We didn't, I don't remember doing any of those things for you. And what was Jesus' statement? When you've done it for the least of these, you've done it for me. When you were a servant, you were serving for me. I was being honored by your service to others. Because it was all about me to start with. It's always all about Jesus. It's not about us. It's Christ in us that matters. Not Christ around us, but Christ in us. It's not that I have to. It's not even that I want to. It's because it's who I am. I am a servant of the Most High God. I am a servant of the Most High God. And why do I serve others? Because my Savior served them first. That's who I am. You become great when it's less about you and more about Him. When you're doing what He would want. And I hear people all the time saying, well, I don't have that much to offer. I can't do much. Can you bring a lunch? Can you give a ride? Can you carry a towel? Don't minimize what you can do for God's kingdom. Don't minimize the impact you can have. Can you hold a baby for a person who needs a baby held? Can you greet someone at a door and make them welcome? Can you open up your home? Can you do any of those things? Yes. We all have something that we can offer. We all have this opportunity to serve in God's kingdom. In the kingdom of God, the little things are the big things. It's the things that go unnoticed that are important. It's the little things that people think are of value that God considers high value. And when we serve, when no one knows that we're serving, we are truly honoring our Lord and Savior. So he calls us to serve. Selfless people serve. Welcome a stranger. Love on a teenager who needs to be loved. Read a child a book. Cook a meal for those who can't do it for themselves. Clean a house for someone who needs it cleaned. Give your coat. Whatever God asks you to do. Bring a lunch. Offer a ride or carry a towel. You don't become great by self-promotion. It's about denying yourself and becoming like Jesus. That's how you become great. I am a servant of the Most High God. And when I serve others, I am serving Christ. Hear that again. I am a servant of the Most High God. And when I serve others, I am serving Christ. So I would encourage every believer to have a place where they can consistently serve God's kingdom. I'm not talking about like once every three months or once a month, some place that you can consistently on an ongoing basis serve God's kingdom, pouring into people's lives, helping others, teaching, being available, having people into your home, helping your neighbor, something that you do consistently all the time to demonstrate who you really are. It's an expression of your being. That's what we're called to do. That's who we're called to be. Someday Jesus is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. 
I hope we all hear those words. Because the greatest among you will be your servant. Correct? I was given a phrase when I was younger as a Christian that really impacted me. I put it in your handout. Being a servant means taking off the bib and putting on the apron. You know? That's what it is. It's not about people serving you. It's about you serving others. And that has stuck with me since the moment I heard it. That's who we are. Serving is not what we do. It is who we are. Be a servant. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are grateful for your love for us and for this opportunity to say thank you. But Lord, help us. Help us to be who it is that you have created us to be, a servant of the Most High God. Lord, help us to remember that when we are serving others, we are literally serving your Son, Jesus. Help us, Father, to get outside of ourselves and not make it about what we want, what we need, or where we want to go or what we want to do, but about where you want us to be and how you want us to serve. Thank you for the example of Jesus, the greatest servant of all time. God, we ask that you would change our hearts. If we struggle with serving others, may you soften our hearts. Invade us, fill us with your spirit, prompt us, God, to serve like you serve. Help us to become less so that your son can become more. And may we honor you through our service to others. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.